we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, which is Professor Gavin Brennan from um, Macquarie University, which is also in Sydney. And uh, he's uh, the director of the Macquarie node for the Centre for Engineered Quantum Systems and a close collaborator of both uh, Dr. Devitt and myself. So I'll hand over to, um, to Gavin now. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to cover maybe in a little bit uh, more detail some of the, the opportunities in these different areas of quantum technology. Simon did a fantastic job. <laughs> I actually cut out some of my slides because he did it better than I had. Um, but yeah, so, um, you know, there are sort of three main sectors we, we think of with quantum technologies. As Simon mentioned, there's uh, quantum computing, um, which includes both the hardware side, like actually, you know, moving towards the holy grail of a, of a fault tolerance quantum computer to uh, software. So designing um, new algorithms that will find an advantage and speed up on quantum computers, um, as well as interfaces between quantum computers and uh, classical computers. Um, and um, as well as the infrastructure behind getting quantum computers to work. So that includes things like uh, uh, cooling systems, if you're gonna be using um, uh, superconducting technologies for quantum computing, then you'll need um, all the apparatus that's required to make those systems work. Or photonics, you'll need networks of uh, fiber optics and highly efficient detectors and so forth. So there's a whole industry behind um, getting quantum computers up to speed uh, on the hardware and the software side. Um, as well as error correction necessary to make uh, quantum computers work in a noisy environments. Uh, then there's quantum communications and uh, quantum sensors. And here, just to show you that uh, there actually are quantum sensors out there, I've, um, I've shown here a, a photo of a gravimeter, which is a device which measures uh, the gravitational fields uh, in a precise way. And um, this is using um, a quantum technology that um, makes use of uh, the fact that in quantum mechanics, you can have superpositions of massive systems like atoms or even larger particles, nanoparticles, and um, different locations of the mass will respond to gravity uh, with different strengths, depending on the location of those masses and the potential. And so then you can extract that information and get a highly precise measurement of gravity. That's just one example of a quantum sensor. Uh, so let me just uh, comment a little bit on how we could imagine quantum technology impacting our lives and uh, how this consequently opens up avenues for um, jobs in the area. So certainly the first one that comes to mind that, that that's, uh, you know, maybe the first thing that politicians think of and um, uh, many companies that are concerned with data security is the fact that quantum computers can crack most common public key cryptography. And um, these systems currently used, uh, for example, systems that use RSA uh, crypto, for things like uh, exchanging uh, transactions uh, over the internet and with your credit card information and so forth. All these systems will need to be upgraded to some kind of post quantum uh, cryptographic systems, which will be secure against future quantum computers. And um, well, this might seem like it's quite a distant prospect. So the typical estimates for the, the the period in which we will have quantum computers large enough to actually be able to be a threat to public key crypto is in the 15 year range. 
Um, nonetheless, the it, it, all of the the companies that want to upgrade need to do so now because there's going to be problems with it. There always are problems, and since there's so much money to be exploited in finding faults with these systems, they need to get ahead of the curve. So um, there's already many companies that are working on upgrading their systems to uh, make use of post-quantum cryptographic system uh, security, and um, there is no current agreed upon standard for post-quantum crypto, although uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the U.S. Uh, put out a call several years ago for uh, post-quantum cryptographic algorithms for both digital signatures and for public key crypto, and it's expected that they'll release uh, the recommended candidates in um, uh, somewhere between 2023 and 2024. Uh, so when that happens, there was, will be a big flurry um, around the world, um, both from consulting companies to uh, you know, small software companies that are wanting to get in the game and uh, rewrite code for their clients. So there's gonna be a big demand for those kinds of jobs. And they're going to need people who are trained in quantum, who can understand, um, you know, what are the necessary requirements, the key links necessary. There's going to be trade-offs for things like, uh, you know, if you use longer key links, it will take uh, more. It will take longer to do transactions. Also, it might increase the processing power needed to do individual transactions, which, when you think about um, millions of these transactions becomes a, an issue that's important. So it requires, it requires people in the field to understand the physics um, and the computer science behind quantum computing to um, actually be useful in that. So I, I do expect that this will be a real career opportunity on the near term. Um, yeah, and then also there's uh, the area of quantum communications, which, um, well, you know, our... Our host here, Peter Rohde, has a book out on the quantum internet where you can learn a lot about this. Um, but you know what's going to happen is that uh, we will be moving to uh, communications with quantum states, and this will basically give us an infrastructure which will support entangled quantum networks, enabling things like distributed quantum computing and distributed quantum sensors, as well as faster and more secure consensus protocols, um, which can be useful for uh, activities like uh, blockchain activities, for example, in, for uh, cryptocurrencies and smart contracts. So um, there, there will certainly be a, a big demand in the industry sectors associated with those for people trained in quantum. Um, on the, on the next side is certainly uh, quantum computing using ultra-fast quantum algorithms. So, uh, you know, some of the big commercial opportunities there are uh, designer chemistry and pharmaceuticals, where you're um, actually looking at uh, chemical properties that are very hard to calculate with classical computers uh, that can be done efficiently with quantum computers, albeit with a large overhead and with uh, error correction and so forth. Um, then there's a, a lot of interest in the use of quantum computers to solve problems in optimization, specifically supply chain optimization. And uh, there's the famous knapsack problem where you want to find the optimal way to fill up your, your, uh, your knapsack with items where you have a cost limit, you can only carry so much weight. And we want to maximize the value of the items inside your knapsack. That's a general problem, which applies to all types of industries. Uh, defense is interested in this um, for outfitting, um, you know, soldiers on the field. Uh, but uh, it also shows up in all kinds of other commercial industries. And quantum computers may offer a speed up in those kinds of things. So um, we expect that there's going to be a lot of interest in these companies hiring people to look at the possibilities of uh, speed up with quantum algorithms. Um, certainly on the finance side, uh, there are possibilities for using quantum computers to perform portfolio optimization and uh, find better arbitrage strategies. 
even if you can find a slightly better um, strategy than you could with a classical algorithm over some fixed period of time, that means a lot of money for um, whatever fund you're working with if you're in this finance sector. And so certainly there's going to be uh, these companies have and will be further hiring people with training in quantum computing. Um, and then we'll just also see some, some new, maybe unanticipated markets for quantum computing uh, using quantum machine learning, visualization, and uh, who knows, but hopefully we'll see an industry of quantum games coming out. Um, in the quantum sensing side, uh, there's uh, the use of, as I mentioned with the gravimeters is one example of a device which uh, uses superposition and entanglements of quantum systems to uh, get a uh, better scaling in the precision of uh, measurement of fields like electric fields, magnetic fields, gravitational fields, uh, inertial sensing. That's that's a way to sense um, your uh, your acceleration, um, which is absolutely necessary for navigation of aircraft. And um, a big activity for quantum sensing, in my opinion, will be in mining. Um, so uh, when, when companies like BHP Billiton, which is based in Australia, do mining for diamonds, they use gravimeters to scan uh, a region of the earth and look for variations in the density, which shows up as variations in the gravitational field from which they can infer the presence of uh, minerals like diamonds. And if you have better sensors, then you can get a much better uh, uh, idea of where the location of these minerals are, and then you save a lot of money in how you drill. So um, this offers a real opportunity for quantum sensors to make a, you know, a, a difference in that area. Um, but there's also other um, opportunities there. So for example, you could use uh, gravimeters for finding aquifers or for cavities in the earth, which could be used for CO2 sequestration. As, um, as well as um, um, using um, uh, quantum sensors, particularly quantum clocks, as a way to perform navigation in GPS denied environments. So there's a lot of interest from the military's point of view in um, having a way to guarantee that your defense uh, assets are going to work, even if there's an attack on your GPS systems and having accurate quantum clocks, as well as frequency standards um, will, will allow for that to happen. On the medical side, then there's also the opportunity to do things like in vivo disease detection using um, quantum sensors. And this is something that's being tested out already. There's some work at the University of Sydney on um, using spins, uh, quantum spins in uh, defect centers of, um, of diamond as a way be to um, do sensitive detection of cellular activity, even in live samples. And that the reason you can do that is because uh, the um, diamond in which these qubits sit uh, is actually non-toxic to uh, most specimens, including humans. So that offers an opportunity to actually think about in vivo um, quantum sensing in uh, humans. So I just pointed out uh, here, um, this is from a, a recent McKinsey report on the, uh, their view on the anticipated impact of quantum computing on um, various sectors of industry. And, you know, I, I understand, you know, Pakistan certainly has a, a plethora of natural resources um, and, and so you see here the estimates of there being a rather uh, disruptive potential for quantum computing in areas like sustainable energy and uh, chemical production um, in the estimated time range of 2030 to 2035. So these are, are large industries worldwide, but they're certainly also large in Pakistan. Um, again, I, 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 don't, I don't claim to know much about the economy of Pakistan, but I assume like most modern economies, they like to um, you know, find better ways to exploit the resources that are there, but also look at um, 
expanding the economy to do um, more uh, finished uh, production and manufacturing and looking for uh, new opportunities to carve out a sector in the world the world uh, commerce. So, uh, you know, that's always a possibility with quantum technologies that say, if you bring well-trained people back into the country, um, if they've been overseas and then have a, a national program for educating them within the country, then you can think about uh, new opportunities. Um, and so like this particular uh, indication of advanced industries for an automotive and aerospace, advanced electronics and so forth is uh, you know, certainly an interest in, in, in pursuit for companies that want to diversify or countries that want to diversify their economies. Um, so, you know, when, if you're just starting out in quantum, it might be a little bit uh, difficult to know where to look and where you want to go. Um, and, you know, the, the typical career paths we, we think of are academia. So just going into like university sectors, either teaching or doing research or both. National labs. Um, most countries have some national labs and or one or more or several net labs, including those focused on physics and computer science. And um, and then of course an in industry and, and Simon pointed out a lot of the- Hey Gavin. Uh, in industry, yeah? Uh, so someone's just pointed out that I think your slides are frozen uh, and it may not be rotating through the slides. Is that right? Oh. Which slide are you meant to be up to? Uh, this one is titled, points. this is a quantum computing report. Oh, you're not okay. seeing any you're slides? Still stuck on oh, you're not seeing any of these. Oh, that's very frustrating. Uh, now it's changed. Now, okay. Can you see any advance? Uh, now it's back on Quantum 2.0. <laughs> oh. Okay, so you didn't see any of those slides. Well, that's very frustrating. Um, hmm. All right, I'm gonna have to, let's see if this helps. Is that advancing? Um, that still shows quantum 2.0. Oh, now it's showing how will QTech impact our lives? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, let me, let me just go to the, that slide I was on previously. Um, this this was the uh, the near term impact of quantum computing in uh, various sectors of the economy. Uh, so yeah, I was just highlighting this. Uh, this is from the McKinsey report released uh, a couple months ago, and notice that there's um, the potential for disruptive impacts in the global energy and materials sector, which I think could be relevant to Pakistan, um, but also that this these. Um, um, these advanced industries, which would point to the opportunities for diversifying the economy, um, semiconductors, advanced electronics, and so forth. Um, so, yeah, uh, as I was pointing out, it, it may be, you know, kind of overwhelming to, to figure out career pathways uh, and where to go, who to meet, um, what, what are the, the best places to to go to, given your background, especially if you're a student, and um, kind of a, a nice review of uh, some of the the places around the world that are open and, and have active quantum programs is given in this uh, quantum computing report um, webpage, which uh, gives a list of um, universities that have uh, active programs in quantum. So for example, um, our program at Macquarie, the Quarry. Center for Quantum Engineering is listed there, as well as the UTS Quantum Software Group, which um, Simon and Peter are part of. Um, and it also lists um, government labs around the world and uh, private startups and public companies that are working on quantum. And also nicely, it lists uh, venture capital firms, or at least some of them that are interested in investing in quantum. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to point out um, just one, just one example of a, a quantum company that I'm highlighting here because the CEO was a former student of mine, Tommaso Demaria, 
so he did he finished his phd i think it was in 2014 and then uh, moved to singapore to do a postdoc with uh, joe fitzsimmons uh, but uh, shortly after started up his own company called entropical labs which is a quantum software company uh, so they're 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 looking at ways to do things like quantum annealing or full bore quantum computing to solve optimization problems, particularly problems um, in involving uh, genomics. Um, so, uh, you know, he he started out very pretty early, but, um, you know, no resources other than just a lot of um, gumption <laughs> and uh, and keen curiosity, and um, he was able to get some funding from a program called SG Innovates, which is a program based in Singapore, which gives some seed funding and training uh, for startups. And then just by, by networking and hard work, he built up this team, which now consists of uh, eight full-time employees. And, um, and I think it's a success. It's, um, he's partnered with some some of the big one, bigger companies, including IBM and Rigetti. So um, I think that's a success story. And it just shows that, you know, you don't have to have a tremendous amount of resources starting out to get somewhere in the field. We're still quite young and um, this is the time to make a difference. You can even do it right out of a PhD. Some people are not even finishing their PhDs and uh, getting into quantum startups. Um, and in Sydney itself, um, we have a quantum ecosystem, which uh, consists of uh, several startups, as well as some larger companies. Um, so these include uh, uh, Silicon Quantum Computing, which is based in Sydney, uh, run by Michelle Simmons, that is working on uh, silicon-based quantum computers, uh, Q Control, which is a University of Sydney spin-out, um, that's uh, working on both quantum sensing and uh, quantum control software to make uh, new quantum machines work in uh, noisy environments. And um, uh, this, this ecosystem is, is built up uh, fairly recently, actually. Um, and what's kind of nice is that uh, we'll soon be opening up a what's called quantum terminal that's uh, based at the central train station in Sydney. So it's right in the middle of the central business district. And uh, there will be three floors, which uh, will include space for several quantum startups, as well as an event space uh, to hold to host conferences. And, um, and this, this quantum terminal will include quantum startups specifically targeted to quantum 2.0 technologies, as well as um, support technologies and, um, and more classical computing technologies, including AI um, and um, blockchain. So uh, this is a kind of an exciting prospect for us, but uh, I just wanted to point out that this, you know, this was something that was recently negotiated with uh, our New South Wales state within Australia. Sydney is located in New South Wales. And this was something that was negotiated with the government actually really only over the past couple of years. <clears throat> so, um, you know, if, if you can make the connections in Pakistan uh, to the right people, it's possible to get these things set up in a relatively sh short time frame. And once you get a few companies in there, you, if, you if you reach a threshold, then you can bring more in and then it attracts uh, foreign investments. So. Yeah, you can build up a real ecosystem in your own environment. So yeah, that's all I have. And apologies that my slides were not showing up, uh, but I'm happy to take questions. Thanks very much for that, Gavin. Um, as with last time, maybe people can just type in uh, any questions into the chat session today. We don't have any, any, other, any other than a request for uh, an email of the presentation. <laughs> Yeah, okay. That's fine. No worries. Um, great. Thank you very much for that, Gavin. That's and and Simon as well. Both of you, that's incredibly helpful. And I think, uh, as you can see from all of this, 
uh, there's far more to the future quantum economy than just people who are highly specialized in one particular thing. Very often students will say, you know, am I uh, strong enough in this or that to be able to get into the quantum computing sector? The answer is, like any industry, it's going to need a huge diversity of different skills. And, uh, and there's a lot of future for many, many different types of uh, skill bases. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I think that's the last session for today, uh, unless uh, Aisha wanted to jump back on. Um, I think that uh, finishes up today. So thank you very much. And thanks, uh, Professor Gavin Brennan and Dr. Simon Devitt. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Peter. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, for this last session, Gavin and uh, Simon and Peter, everybody, thank you very much. It was very informative. And I thank all the speakers of the day. And um, so we are done with today. And I hope that you had uh, you have gained something from, from today's session. And we will resume tomorrow at uh, uh, 9.30 a.m. Pakistan time in the morning. So see you then. So um, thank you very much for being here. And uh, have a good day.